both frustrating and something that I'm I'm also grateful for because we wouldn't be able to connect otherwise. I want to do uh, try and try my screen share. Uh, see if I can pull that off again. Uh, and then one of you helped me before with what to hit. I think it's slideshow that I'm looking for. Yeah. Okay. And then should be play from the beginning. From beginning. Okay. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> do we have anyone new this time around? Uh, new to us, or are are we all repeat attenders? I wasn't here in person, but I watched the recording of the last one. Okay, super, super. Uh, so uh, what I'd like to do is um, uh, just do a uh, a little bit of a, a recap. Uh, I found this cartoon with Calvin and Hobbes and just found it just priceless. And my wife said to me the other day, now, when are you going to give those pastors grief again? And I said, I may have to use that line. So uh, I want to give appropriate credit to her. Just a simple recap from last time. When, when I was reflecting since we last got together, I thought, what, what, are, what are some of my takeaways? Uh, maybe yours are different, and I welcome that. But if, if I wanted to sum, summarize um, uh, some of the key themes from last time. It's to lift up that James Dittus uh, uh, concept that ministry is grief work. And when I came out of seminary, I had all of this idealization about uh, what ministry could be and and how churches can work together. And I, I've not relinquished any of those dreams, but I've recognized that for uh, for me to get anything done in the local congregation, as well as a, a constellation of local churches that are trying to express ourselves as the church, the big C church, that uh, we have a lot of work to do uh, around, um, uh, let's just say, the, the baggage that we carry that we may not know that we're carrying. And James did us in that a good book recalling ministry really lifts that up to remind me and I think remind pastors that ministry is first and foremost uh, working through grief and loss issues. Number two is that churches operate in a, in a culture of loss and uh, I think the COVID reality has uh, just deepened that all the more as I may have said last time, as I regularly say in my own ministry context, even prior to COVID, uh, congregants were not monogamous with their church. They chose another church for a uh, youth group and another church had a better praise team and another church had awesome service projects. And they, they were very comfortable having an a la carte approach to, to church. And in my setting, people were uh, were and have been very comfortable uh, in the summertime, they go up north, and in Michigan, that means to a, uh, they'll call it a cottage, but a second residence or a third residence. And in the wintertime, they'll go to Arizona and um, Florida, uh, where it's warmer, um, and it's not the Midwest, as you well know. And, and so uh, they've, they've been part of other communities of faith long before COVID, and now uh, now we find ourselves in a COVID world where I've got parishioners who haven't shown up for a year and also who will say, yeah, I go to six churches on Sunday from my, from my kitchen. And, and so um, even prior to COVID, I think we have to be attentive to the fact that church is not, isn't in people's lives the way it once was, where just like we used to build our towns with the church in the center and the, the houses and the community and businesses around it, that was emblematic of how society structured itself. It was around, uh, our lives orbited the center, uh, which was the church. And uh, all of us, no matter what age we are on this, uh, in this viewership or virtual engagement, have recognized that that world has been gone, but now the next question is, uh, given that that's gone, what does COVID now do to, 
to, to those dynamics. And we'll, we'll talk more about that next time. Uh, third is pastors can't do it alone. Uh, I think we need a support system and I think we need, we can't look to our, uh, to our, uh, in my shop, it's elders, uh, our, our council, our lay leaders. I don't think we can look to our spouse or our partner for, uh, uh, for some of the care that we need. I, I think there's no shame in that. I think it's important to acknowledge that. It's not fair for me to share all of the things that are burdening me about my church life uh, with my wife, for example. Um, that will spoil her experience with uh, with her church. I've also, uh, I say this anecdotally, I've also long believed that our spouses or our partners should be able to have their membership in a different shop than the one that I'm serving in, but that's not going to happen in my lifetime in my denomination, but I think that would be so much healthier. Fourth, um, we don't know what we don't know. I opened last time with talking about uh, we need to know, we, first, we need to know that we have blind spots. And second, we need help in knowing what's in them. Is it a bike or is it a semi? Um, and, and I don't think we can do that alone. When we process our own losses and our own griefs, I think it gives us uh, what I'll say the foreign language requirement that we, we never got in seminary. Some of us never got in seminary. And it, it may just be the, the leadership gift set that, that uh, many of us need for, uh, for navigating in our congregations. So I want to give a, a quick illustrative story, and then, uh, then we're going to take our first pause because I want to see if there's anything lingering from last time. But one of my more formative experiences in the congregation I'm serving right now was uh, the first progressive potluck and and we went into our youth center uh and there were tables set up and you had a you were assigned a table and and you had salad at one <clears throat> you had appetizers at a next table with a different uh, cluster of people and then you had your main dish at another table and dessert at another so in the course of the evening you you met everybody in the room and I got to my third table and I thought, why did I even come to this? These people are so depressing. And, and I, I was reflecting on what I was hearing at every table and, and they were all grousing uh, about uh, uh, in the past, this drew 120 people or 150 people. And on a Saturday night, there were about 45, 50 people at this event. And, and all they were doing the entire time at, at every table was talking about the way this used to be. And I began to realize that they were grieving. And rather than being critical of that, um, and I was at, at first, uh, having realized what was going on at every table, I began to ask some questions about, well, tell me what that was like back then. And and, and uh, so they would talk about that and how all oh, people would get dressed up and whatever. And, and then I began to talk about some of the other things that were going on in the community that were involving people from the church, somewhere in small groups, somewhere at a basketball game, there was a skating party. And I said, you know, I start adding up all of those different activities that people are at. And there's, there, there might be more than 150 people getting together. It's just different. And you could begin to see them, oh, hadn't thought about it that way. And, and, and I said, uh, you know, this person was in charge of this event tonight, and, and she's got some games that she's got planned for. Oh, we never did games before. Oh, this is, this is something. And, and I, that experience of, of that kind of encounter with them uh, really began to shape the way that I tried to engage in, in conversations with, with a church that, that uh, tends to look back. And I don't know any church that isn't nostalgic. And nostalgia is a, is a sign of grieving. And uh, good pastoring pays attention to that. So I want to just pause like we will periodically do 
And uh, maybe I shouldn't say let's start with you, but I, I, I'd love to just pause for a minute as we recap from last time. Is there anything lingering? Is there anything new? Is there anything you want to uh, bring forward uh, so that we we at least um, we're, we're attentive to where you may be or what you come to or what you you bring to today? So I'll pause. I can give you, I guess, an example or maybe something to flesh out what you just talked about, if this helps. Uh, when you're talking about the people ta remembering the, you know, the good old days or how wonderful it was, I found myself hearing those conversations and things that we're not doing anymore. Like, I'll, okay, specifically, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> I lost you. Um, I'm learning that they have a long standing tradition of singing the doxology at the end of the worship service, which also I should just clarify that yes, we're singing in church and that's a whole nother story. Um, but uh, I think it sounds wonderful. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I've never led a worship service, which, and it sounds like a simple thing but I'm having a heck of a time figuring out like, okay, as much as I think that sounds great and I don't see any harm in it, how do you make that jump? I mean, there's so many things. I mean, you can't be jumping every time you find out something that they miss, but like there are times when it just is awkward to try to, you can't just keep jumping back to the way things were because it never will be. But sometimes I think there needs to be a balance. I think there does need to be a balance and you have to figure out what are their, um, what is, what does this mean to people? What is, what is the meaning of that? And when you can, when you can discern that, I think it gives you a little more imaginative freedom around recasting that. Um, so what does that mean if that's the doxology is done as a solo? What does, what does it mean if, uh, you know, video is played. What is what 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 are the what are the different ways of scratching that itch and and starting and creating new traditions? Uh, but that that takes a sturdy relationship and and um, you you don't want to take away one of their anchors. You may want to add to it or invite them to have new anchors. If you know um, if you know about childhood development, you know that uh, in the absence of a parent, um, a child sometimes has a blanket or a bunny or a little teddy bear. That's a transitional object, a reminder of uh, of the parental unit when when the parent is not able to be there. So, what are our congregation's transitional objects? We don't want to throw them out. <laughs> Uh, but we also want to respect what need that that uh, transitional object is is scratching. I, I muted. I said thank you. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. Anyone else? Keep rolling. When Laura nods, I roll. <laughs> That's a nod. Okay. I have to cough a minute. <coughs> oh, and I didn't even hit the mute button. Sorry about that. <laughs> I've got one shot in me too, and I'm uh, hopefully healthy. So uh, let's let's uh, talk about where I'd, I'd love to give us a map of where we might go uh, because your pastors and I've met very few pastors who don't like resources. I want to give a few more book recommendations. I want to talk about mental models. I want to talk about a research study. Uh, I want to talk about uh, lead through uh, the use of relationship um, and with the goal of growing trust. And then I want to, if there's time, uh, there's some wisdom nuggets and, and also some strategies for some emotional security. This is going to uh, probably focus more on 
on leadership and not technique, but uh, we'll we'll talk about the loss part a little bit, but we're we're moving away from that a, a bit. So th here's my rough outline. We've got more than enough to go on. So the good news is if we get wound up in some kind of good conversation, you'll still get the PowerPoints that I've created even if we don't get to the bottom of these. Sound good? Okay, here we go. Uh, I may have mentioned this last time. This is one of the most formative books for me. Heifetz and Linsky are educational leaders at Harvard and uh, they're the ones who have the insight that the first work of leadership is processing the losses. So they say people don't fear change. What they really fear is loss. So uh, pastors are wise to say, uh, okay, you know, they may be German or Dutch or some form of European and and those folks can be stubborn. And I say that as a German person who serves Dutch people, um, say all of us, can, some of us can be pretty stubborn. Um, well, maybe it's not stubbornness, it, it's, it's fear. And so uh, how, do we, how do we help people uh, grow some resilience in, in what they might be afraid of? Because ultimately I don't think they're afraid of change. I think they're afraid of losing something. Uh, they're, these guys do some great work. Uh, Hostage at the Table uh, is just, I think, a fine leadership book. It, it's probably one of the best leaderships book, leadership books I've read in a decade. Peter Stenke uh, introduced this book to me uh, probably a decade ago or so. And, and the sum of this is this is written by a hostage negotiator who says every hostage situation I've been involved in, including when I've been taken hostage has involved two things. The hostage takers got some form of relational uh, distress that has reached an epic point. And now they're taking hostages in, in the attempt to manage some of that discomfort and distress. And so what Cole Reiser says is you have to find a way to establish a, a bond and a connection with them in such a way where you join them in that place of distress, you companion them and you sort of walk it, walk them through it. And when I read this book, I think, yeah, that's what pastors do. That's what good pastors need to do all of the time. Uh, and and his, uh, his encouragement is for leaders to recognize the ways in which uh, we have some unfinished business so that uh, we don't uh, take ourselves hostage or we're not held hostage by uh, our past and, and by those things that have a, a hidden power in our lives. So if uh, Aunt Lily is still in play here for you guys to, uh, to have more books, uh, th this is a good one. Uh, Bridges uh, write a great book on transitions. It tends to be for organizations and, and businesses. Uh, they talk about three phases to help um, your organization through an ending, through a neutral zone, to a new beginning. Now, if any of you have ever read uh, uh, Walter Brueggemann, you, you'll understand that he'll talk about orientation, disorientation, and reorientation. And uh, I love it when people in the business world and in the leadership world and folks who are theological or psychological uh, are saying the same kinds of things, just using different kinds of vocabulary. And uh, this is a really good uh, manageable book on, no pun intended, on organizational change. Uh, the last one is, uh, this is probably the most important book I've read in five to seven years. It's not so much about leadership, but it's a, very much about our context. And uh, I'm, I come out of the... Uh, Reform tradition or Dutch Reform tradition, Calvinists, and uh, this, the the, I, I hesitate to say debate. The ongoing discussion among some of us is, uh, we have always identified with being evangelical. Uh, can we anymore after the last five years? And some of us are saying, mm, I don't know. Uh, and Dume is how you say her name. Uh, does a phenomenal job of tracing from World War II to the current time, 
about how evangelicalism in America has tipped toward masculinity, uh, toward power, toward uh, uh, military and, and oppositional uh, kinds of themes. And she just does an amazing job. I, I've shared this with my church librarian and, and she said, I had no idea that Billy Graham was a lifelong Democrat. This is blowing my world. Uh, and, and you can read in this book about how, you know, she cites that in the late 60s and early 70s, it was the Southern Baptist Convention and Christianity Today that were saying, given what's going on in the lives of, of women, you know, maybe we as Christians need to make more room for therapeutic abortions. And uh, I never read that before, and she documents it. And those are the kinds of things that uh, boy, if you're going to engage those kind of conversations in my community, you, you better be really smart, better be very careful, or you better be wearing Kevlar. Uh, so uh, I'm going to pause again. Any questions on any of these books that I lift up? Because um, I suspect there might be a book lover or two in our group. That's a sign to keep moving, unless, Laura, there are comments uh, that are worth tending to. Not at this time? No, I'll just say, um, if you do hear a book- Are you muted uh, or am I? Oh, oh, there you go, sorry. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, if, if you do see a book that you want, um, CGP will send it to you. So just let me know. Um, and from the last presentation, you could go back through, I'm gonna go back through the recording and I'm gonna make a list of all of, because you've it's been such a list of resources. So um, so maybe you want to wait till the very end of all three sessions or whatever. Just let me know what book you might want and we'll send it to you. And if Lily's generous, just pick them all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep rolling. <clears throat> so getting at mental models, this is uh, this is important for our uh, in terms of how I'm thinking about how how we can approach this, how we can on-ramp. I Somewhere on these slides, I note uh, the, next, the next break will be at slide 20, uh, just so we can pace ourselves. Um, entering the topic. So what I wanna think about is uh, imagining and reimagining some of the formative factors and experience that shape us as, as persons and pastoral leaders. And I wanna use a story again, I wanna use a study as well as grounded theory, and then we can decide whether or not there's, there's conversation. So here's the story. Uh, a number of years ago, I was listening to Science Friday on NPR, and they were interviewing a guy who is uh, doing some research on what, uh, what led young men in particular into an interest in science. How did you pursue a PhD in astrophysicists? physics. Um, how did you end up in chemistry and whatever? And as he was talking uh, repeatedly and doing some qualitative interviews with these folks, he found some common themes that, well, depending on the age, um, uh, somebody who did some soul searching said, well, I grew up watching Gilligan's Island and, and I love the professor. And, and, and he kind of activated this interest in me in, in becoming a scientist and um, <clears throat> someone else had said uh, Captain Kirk and 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 then the other thing that he with some of the older researchers he discovered that that uh, they were formed under Thomas Swift and I I don't know that I had ever heard of Thomas Swift and and he said well uh, prior you know prior to uh, World War One uh, there were the Thomas Swift novels and it was. It was some of the first science fiction stuff where, where uh, a guy talked into his watch or someone went to a, a phone on the wall that you cranked, but there, were, there was a screen on the wall and he could actually talk. And, and he said, you know, some of, the, uh, some of the things like Skype came out of this and the, the interviewer pushed him on this and said, come on, is, is this really the case? And he said, he said, have you ever heard, uh, are you familiar with a taser? And the guy said, well, of course I am. And he said, uh, the taser was invented around 1969. And uh, he said, the guy who wrote it, or the guy who invented it, 
uh, invented it on the basis of having read Thomas Swift novels. In fact, there's a novel called Thomas Swift and his electric no novel. This, this book was published in 1915 and Thomas Swift had a rifle that would shoot people and it would stun them, it wouldn't kill them. So the guy who invased, invented the taser uh, invented it following his lifelong hero and it's called the taser because it's the Thomas A. Swift electric rifle. That's how taser got its name. And so um, what I wanna uh, say is that, uh, that one of the things that this evoked in me is the sense that everything in creation, everything in this world is created twice. It's created first in the imagination and then in the actualization. So uh, somebody you know, imagined this coffee cup, they sketched it, they engineered it, and then they did it. And I think human beings and certainly human relationships work that way. So if we're attentive to what's going on in terms of our mental models for how uh, relationships work, how we imagine church, a lot of this is unconscious. So how do we bring this to, to consciousness a little bit, at least as pastors? So uh, one of the things that I did in, uh, finished it in 2016, is a quantitative research study to ask the question, since attachment theory is about how we do loss, and it's about how we do relationships, what, what's going on with pastors in terms of the leadership that they enact and, uh, and, and how relational or task oriented are they? And then what kind of implications does that have on their capacity for longevity? Um, I don't know anyone who's ever done a study like this. And I, I did it in a, at Western Michigan University in an educational leadership program, which was phenomenal for me because it, it was an interdisciplinary department that uh, brought out psychology, educational theory, as well as leadership theory. The downside of that is every one of those departments wanted to stick their talons in my project and say, uh, okay, pr prove this in, in our domain. And, and so uh, my research study had everything to do with education, leadership, and psych and clergy in the church, which is what I care most about. And um, when you get the PowerPoints, uh, that link on the bottom, if, uh, I don't know if you've ever read a doctoral dissertation, I don't recommend it, but uh, you know, if, if you want to, it's there. Uh, so what I did was uh, I start with attachment theories, two working theories that say um, uh, attachment theory is the distress mechanism that every uh, child and every person has uh, that's all about uh, survival. And uh, it, it's also becomes, uh, as we have this um, need and response from our, our caregivers going on, a dynamic is created around how we do relationships and, and uh, children uh, begin to establish a set of rules around how um, how relationships work. And so, as I mentioned last time, what happens is that can instill a sense of security in, in children. It, if there's some uh, ambivalence or some inconsistency there that can lead some anxiety of, of uh, can I trust someone else to be there for me? Uh, will they affirm my experience of distress? Will that cause me to be suspicious or will it make me clingy? And the third is uh, I can't trust myself or my responses or someone else to be there in my time of need. And then I become uh, a, a avoidant. And these are, you know, these are conditioned responses over ages zero to three. And the research demonstrates that uh, what happens there tends to be our operative mental model, our operational model that continues to get reinforced through the rest of our lives. And it's in, uh, in early childhood, it's in 
middle school and high school, it's romantic relationships. And then the research of the last 20, 25 years has been in leader follower relationships. And so my passion was to say, if we can get a handle on attachment behaviors of pastors, how does that impact the kind of leadership that they bring to their congregations? And, and what does that look like? Recognizing that uh, a big piece of this is how do we handle loss and disappointment? And if we can process that, that deepens our capacity for empathy. And if we don't, uh, what happens is we tend to have diminished empathy. Again, we're going to pause at 20 because I just gave you a lot. The other working theory that I want to work with is transformational leadership uh, uh, pioneered by James McGregor Burns. For a long time, I mean, leadership theory is, goes back to about the 1800s. Uh, Thomas Carlyle uh, writes about it in the mid 1800s. And, and uh, leadership is... Uh, is you know, somebody who makes history, somebody who's a, a spiritual leader, someone who, uh, you know, who changes history. You get to a point of Marx and Engels in, in the 60s, and they say, no, it's not about the, the traits of a, a leader or spiritual traits of a leader. It, it's about the circumstances. And, and uh, you look at the 40s and, and Max Weber, who talks about um, uh, about the the uh, d dynamic and the charisma that that happens with with uh, the leader, and it's the charisma that really makes makes a difference, that that brings influence to bear on the leader follower relationship. So, if you follow leadership theory, um, what you find in the last couple of decades is what do we do with charisma in terms of leadership and and influence? That these tend to be the the things that, uh, that, that really make a, a difference. So how does that work in the leader follower dynamic? Well, uh, James McGregor Burns talks about how if uh, the leader and the follower are, are uh, working together and are learning from one another in, in a relational dynamic, uh, what's researchably provable is that motivation, morale, and morality in all three, in both of them is, is lifted in the dynamic of their relationship. And that's, that's a leadership uh, uh, strategy that I try and work with in, in my ministry. I'm not a fan of servant leadership where, where someone's uh, always setting themselves aside and their wishes and their desires, and somebody tends to end up on a cross when when there's servant leadership. And I acknowledge that in my in my own tradition, servant leadership is always lifted up in in the seminary. And and I I try a more collaborative approach to say I want to learn uh, with with followers. I want to work in that dynamic so that there's a higher level of excellence in both of us. Well. James McGregor Burns ca calls that transformational leadership, and he recognizes that one horse will pull 5,000 pounds, two horses will pull 15,000 pounds, and that's the kind of relationship I want to have in my congregation and the kind of leadership that I want to do. Another form of leadership is transactional leadership. You scratch, uh, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine, let's just get things done. And uh, the, the project is whatever the project is, and it doesn't matter what, we're, uh, what our relationship is. And, and then there's passive avoidant leadership, which tends to be no leadership at all. My, uh, my study measured uh, attachment styles, and it measured capacity for one of these kinds of leaderships. And then it interfaced with, with 19 different traits asking how, how do these things relate together? And uh, that, that allowed it to become a, uh, a scientific study of, of pastors and the leadership and the attachment style that they have. What was the problem? What was the occasion for this? Well, in 2007, um, uh, this guy uh, claimed somewhat substantially that 1,700 pastors per month 
in the US uh, were, were leaving their posts forever. Um, a, different, a different approach in uh, 2011 said 28% of Christian ministers surveyed acknowledge that they've been terminated and some of them three or four times and uh, other surveys put that in the 19 to 41 percent range depending on the denomination so what i did is i created a study of my denomination and that involved 995 pastors and uh, but the my denomination between uh, 1990 and 2000 had an almost a 600 percent increase in terminations and um uh and and that that didn't even include the resignations of of pastors now i, I want to anecdotally say with you too that that in the last month i've talked to some of my denominational leaders and they are cautiously i should say you know somewhat quietly fearing that covid is going to cost my denomination about 25% of our pastors, not from death, but from saying, I'm done, I, 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 I can't do this anymore. And so even though this research study is based on almost five-year-old data now, uh, I think we're in a new era of, of concern and care for ourselves and our churches and our profession around you know, what are going to be some of the costs on, on pastors in terms of uh, working in this culture of loss and how do we do it how do we process it for ourselves for our congregations and and uh how do we navigate through uh through this new covid time that is unprecedented uh, there's a connection between attachment and leadership uh two psychologists observed that uh, in their experience in working with uh, pastors as pastoral therapists, it came down to three things all of the time. Clergy narcissism, where pastors are working out their issues on their congregation. Uh, disorganization, where uh, we're not, uh, you know, we, we don't have the administration and organizational gifts to hold reality together, or an inability to connect. Every time these uh, therapists met with pastors, it was one of these three themes that was at work in the pastor that uh, was a significant contributor to uh, what was going on for them. And so what, what I wanna observe with you is that all three of those uh, stem out of a particular kind of way of doing relationship that's grounded in attachment theory. So what I did is I used an established questionnaire I, uh, for attachment, uh, and uh, the MLQ is the most respected uh, transformational leadership um, questionnaire that's used in business and industry. Uh, there's uh, Now there's more than 50,000 of these uh, questionnaires that have gone out and uh, asked, um, you know, 91 questions in all of these pastors, and I paid a place in California to, uh, you know, oversee this whole process so that I did not have any connectivity to it, that pastors knew that their responses would be protected and that they'd be safe. And um, that independent agency managed my data collection for me to ensure that this would be a credible study. So I've just given you a lot of stuff and we're going to pause for a moment for questions or comments. Uh, the next phase of this is just going to tell you some of what I found. So feel free to unmute and ask a question or make a comment or uh, put it in the chat and I can ask it for you. Something that, that struck me that just, it's so simple, but when you talked about uh, our experiencing a positive response, opening our eyes and just the idea of empathy how empathy is based on shared experience. And if we're not experiencing positive responses, that, that it works that way too, that we can't give something that we don't, that it's reciprocal, that empathy is reciprocal and that our tanks are, are often empty. That's like I said, very simple, basic, but affirming and, and thank you for, for that. I, I think, um... 
Now I'm going to go to our childhood and our life outside the congregation to say, um, we cannot give what we haven't received. Um, uh, there's a book uh, that I can't remember, and I will try, um, that features a story about Jack Casey, uh, who, um, uh, who comes up across an accident scene and he, uh, what he does is uh, there's a guy hanging upside down in a pickup truck and uh, Jack Casey, who's an emergency responder, goes in and sits with this guy. And the guy says, get out of here. There's gas dripping all around. This place is going to blow. And, and he said, no, I'm going to stay by your side. And, and they extricate this guy and he's hauled out on a stretcher. And the guy says, thank you, but you are stupid. Are you an idiot? What's the matter with you? Why would you stay with me? And Jack Casey says, he says, you know, when I saw you pinned in there, he said, I was reminded of when I was seven and I was facing an extraction of another kind. I was at the dentist office and, and uh, this kindly nurse held my hand when I went, went under. And when I came out, she was still there. She remained by my side. And when I saw you pinned in there, that's where I went, and that's why I stayed with you. And, and I, what I want to say is uh, we need to have those kind of places that we draw from as we seek to be uh, empath an empathetic presence in the life of our congregation. Uh, as, as I think, uh, uh, as, a, as a motivator and a tank, as you say, uh, from which we, we do our ministry. Now, when we do that, I, I think, I want to say, I think we have to be um, realistic enough not to expect that from our congregations. I don't know that they're always going to be able to be reciprocal. So I think we have to, our reserve tank has to be filled somewhere else. Now, for me, that's other relationships, that's people from outside the church, that's my therapist. Um, those are places that I know that I can uh, draw from and be reinforced in ways that my congregation probably isn't going to do it. So that when I get a nice note or a gift card for a night away from my congregation, uh, that's exceptional and that's really nice, but I'm not, I can't expect that from them. That would be my response to your, uh, to what you've shared. So thank you. I have a question. Uh, well, first of all, a comment. Just my wife is a uh, early childhood special education teacher, and so the you know I've never heard this kind of conversation of attachment uh, in early childhood as a you know as something to think about in terms of leadership and particularly in the church. So I'm just really intrigued by all of this. So thank you for that. Um, I'm just wondering if you know part of my observation is the church is full of wounded people. Obviously, we're all broken people, and in, in varying degrees. Um, when we're pulling from a, we pull from that population for our leadership, then we're, sometimes I wonder we're not necessarily getting people that have been healthy and well their whole lives that are thinking, oh, I should be a pastor. How do we go about, I, I'm, maybe this is too big of a question, but I just think about leadership development and even recruitment for pastors about how we're, how this can be applied to say, you know, maybe this isn't for you. Be, we love you and we care about you, but the, the, the wounds that you carry with you, maybe from early childhood or other times in your life, will, will be too big of an obstacle to overcome that this really won't be healthy for you. Is that something that your research has drawn you into of thinking about how this plays out in terms of not only tending to pastors now, but also recruiting potential pastors? Um, Bryant, that is such a fine question. Um that I don't even want to try and answer it, but I'm going to try. Um, my, I, I'm not sure about, I, I'm not going to draw a research conclusion about that, but I'll draw a personal one from it to say, I think um, seminaries, that would be the on-ramp in my shop, um, uh, or those who are thinking about seminary, uh, have to, for the sake of the church, uh, bear some of this in mind as we are, uh, are as we are developing 
formal leaders um, and to say, to be able to say, and early on, some of the wounds that you carry are, are too much for you. The, the ministry of the church is far too important than uh, for, uh, for you to be able to be in this role. Now, I am on the board of our denominational seminary, and uh, this is a really, really difficult thing to do when seminaries are scrambling for students, when they're trying to, uh, you know, keep faculty occupied, when seminaries uh, tend to talk more about uh, the number of admissions that they have rather than talking about graduates. So in, in my seminary, um, I regularly bring up every, every graduate school, uh, every college that, that advertises in, in the Grand Rapids, Michigan area, when they put it up on a bull, billboard, we'll say 96% uh, of our grads have a job within you know, two months or whatever of graduation. Uh, I, seminaries don't tend to do that. Seminaries tend to say, oh, we have 20 new students this year. And, and, and so changing the, the mental model around you know, seminaries really need to have uh, a clearinghouse um, function and a vetting function for the sake of the church so that we don't graduate folks and within five years uh, they've closed a church or they've split a church or uh, they're out of ministry. We don't serve the church or those prospective leaders well at, at all. And I think uh, seminaries need to find ways of baking into the formation process to say, you know what, you might be better suited for this. Uh, <clears throat> I have not seen a seminary do that well. My own is, is trying to do that more often, but I don't think it's about setting more testing. It's about having honest one-on-one -on -one conversation to say, you know what, I love you. I see that you have amazing gifts but I don't think they're for our ordained ministry. Any comments we should tend to, Laura, or do I keep rolling? There's nothing in the chat and hearing no one else. Keep rolling. We, we roll. We roll. Some research study results. Um, uh, that's where we are next. Um, uh, I had 995 uh, potential people take this uh, survey, this safe survey. Um, and my advisor said, you are asking such personal questions. What are you going to do if you don't get 75 responses? And I said, oh, I'll, I'll get 75. Well, I had 348 completed. And if you do the math on that, that's more than a third of my denomination's pastors uh, uh, responded, which statistically is astonishing. Uh, maybe what's even more important is I had 118 people quit uh, and didn't finish the survey. And my, my uh, doctoral team said to me, you know, you could do a whole nother dissertation on what's going on with those people who, who quit, uh, because I think there's probably a lot going on, but I can't prove that for you. Uh, my denomination has been very, very, very slow in um, having good gender balance in our leadership. Uh, it's not, it's only been a decade or a decade and a half that we have uh, permitted women in leadership. And I'm not proud of that, but it's one of the facts on the ground. Um, so 5% of the pastors in my denominational tradition are women. I had 7% of my study um, uh, were, were women. So I had good proportionate representation in, uh, in this research study. I have nine key find, findings, and one of them, uh, the one that was probably most scientific, uh, most important scientifically, is that uh, when there's attachment security, there's more and higher and better transformational leadership. And that, that is something that was very important to join the uh, scientific and researchable tradition to say, 
when pastoral leaders have, are, are enacting transformational leadership, they have higher levels of empathy. When they have higher levels of empathy, they have higher levels of transformational leadership. And when I had that finding uh, show up, uh, it made me glow because, okay, now we're on to something. Uh, the reverse was also true uh, when when there wasn't as much empathy, there was more avoidant or transactional leadership. And that's important to know too, but we'll, we'll get there. Uh, the clergy who participated in the study uh, scored high in attachment uh, security, but also saw, scored high in uh, discomfort with closeness. And that would seem to move against one another scientifically. So then you take your scientist hat off and you step away and say, well, wait a minute, uh, let's look at the profession. And every pastor I know wants to have some level of connectivity with parishioners, but also has been burned, has also been hurt a little bit. So uh, we, we want to be engaged and transparent with our congregations, but you know, I don't know if I'm going to tell you everything. And when I came across this, uh, my, my thesis team said to me, uh, explain this to, to, to us, this finding. And I said, here's the dynamic on the ground. And they said, oh, that makes so much sense. So when you find yourself or you find a colleague in a, in a spot where uh, they have real connection gifts, but they've also got some scar tissue and, and a little bit of caution, I think there's scientific demonstration for that here. Number three, um, uh, these pastors scored above average in two of the five transformational traits that I was measuring. Uh, do you have behaviors, do your followers have behaviors that you, they can look up to? And do you, do you give individual consideration to, uh, to followers? These, these pastors scored higher than average um, they also scored higher than average uh, in terms of work satisfaction. And so uh, you read this in some of the more recent studies in the last seven years, even though pastors are stressed and uh, they're dealing with burnout or, or whatever, they love the job. I, I mean, they, they've, they've got good positive, many have good positive uh, feelings about the work that they're trying to do. And and the research here uh, carries that through. Number four, um, the, the clergy have, um, in the study, they averaged having served two congregations or two and a half, and they averaged seven years. Now, anecdotally, in, in my shop, six or seven years is uh, the, the time in which we say every pastor gets a sabbatical every six or seven years. You either get a sabbatical or you're, you go to another church where you get another two years of, ha, ah, I, can, I can have an, another honeymoon. So <clears throat> again, this, this scientifically demonstrated what some of us think to be true. Number five, the clergy of this study had a relatively low termination rate. They acknowledged that uh, almost 10% had had a uh, uh, a termination where they either separated from their congregation. In my tradition, you can't quit or be fired, but you can divorce. And, and so the local, um, uh, what do you, in the Lutheran tradition, what do you call your, your local assembly? It's not a synod, is it? Yeah, it's a synod. It's a synod. Okay. Uh, in my shop, it's a classes. So I'm, I'm in a classes where there are about 20 20 different churches. And so the classes has to meet together to approve a separation agreement. And there, there has to be weighty reasons given um, uh, for why this took place. We just processed um, the third one in three months yesterday. We've got 24, 25 pastors in my, in my classes, and we've lost three in the last three months. And each one of them, our pastors said, I'm done. I, I need to initiate a divorce. It's not, I'm not blaming them. I'm just tired. I'm done. Well, in the study, um, uh, uh, almost 10% of our clergy acknowledged that they had had a separation at one time or another. 
And if we were to go back to um, uh, this 118 uh, survey quitters, I wonder how many of, of, of those had they, when they got to this question, I wonder how many quit my survey. So I'm inclined to think the real number is higher than 10, 10%, but it's 10% of those who took my survey have had some kind of failure with their congregation. Uh, the weak areas, the strong areas travel together. Well, so do the, the weak areas. So uh, the study showed that as discomfort with closeness increases, um, the desire to be more task-driven also increases. So clergy who um, don't have a, a good rapport, a ability, natural gifts, EQ, to connect with their congregation may be those who put more uh you know, more energy into getting a task done and probably doing that somewhat uh, independently. And a clergy who have difficulty with connecting may also have greater needs for affirmation and approval. Uh, which you go back to attachment theory, that fits. Mom walks in the door, a caregiver walks in the door, and I really, I really want her at a boy. I really want her at a girl. And and I'm not getting it, and it's creating some distress and anxiety in me. And so um, th that's worth paying attention to. So, and then paying attention to on number seven of my finding is the greatest predictor for a shorter longevity in, in the study is the trait of needing approval. Now, I'm a regional pastor, which means I, I'm a pastor to pastors. And my pastors who are in trouble in my classes, your version, the synod, are those pastors who are, are desperately uh, seeking some affirmation, uh, some attention, some attaboys, some attagirls from, uh, from their leaders and aren't getting it. And, and I'm, I want to acknowledge that it's, it's stressing the relationship because they are they're in a spot of, this is something I need from my congregation at levels I'm not getting. And in my study, it uh, for every point, measurable point uh, higher uh, that this showed up, it shortened their lo longevity by almost 18 months on average. So uh, again, this you can discern for yourself whether or not you want to extrapolate the results in one denomination to another. I'm not suggesting you should. Uh, I, I don't know why you couldn't, but uh, take that for what it's worth. But in my particular denomination with these church leaders, this is what happened. If you, if you, need, uh, if you have a need for approval that, that you want and you're not getting from your congregation, in my shop, I can tell you, it's going to shorten your professional longevity there. Number eight, uh, two traits that showed uh, up as an increase in longevity is relationships as secondary and management by exception passive. Now, I, I want to lift before you that those two categories, those measurable categories, are negative ones. When you're trying to measure transformational leadership, uh, you're going to say, naturally, you're going to say, oh, if you have these traits, you're going to have a shorter longevity. No, for pastors, uh, you're going to have a longer one. So, and you might have a year longer than others. So, uh, why is that? Well, what I want to say is it suggests that the unique arena in which pastors work is such that uh, the congregations may prefer a more passive and they may prefer a more non engaged style of leadership. Hmm, that doesn't fit transformational leadership at all. Why is that? Well, uh, it suggests that um, pastors who enact a transformational leadership style where, where they want to do leadership with the congregation, where they want to do this with le uh, other leaders, this ideal form of leadership, in a sense, is the very thing that could put you at risk. If the risk is, I want to have a long lifespan at this congregation, it's the very thing, transformation in the local church is the very thing 
that could get you in trouble. So my bid to pastors all the time is to say, if you take your prophetic and priestly role seriously and you do it well, you are putting yourself at risk, professional risk, which is to say, uh, my discovery is, I'll put it in red, uh, pastors who need regular approval and affirmation are likely to have a shorter lifespan. Second, uh, pastors who practice passive management by exception and a more passive style uh, uh, may have a longer uh, longevity. And, uh, and the long and the short of this is my conclusion is pastors uh, or congregations may want you to be a priest who just holds reality together rather than to be a prophet. Go back to the Old Testament and uh, the, the people of God have 3,000 years of proven history to say they are a not-for-profit organization. They don't want profits. Uh, they don't want people to challenge reality. And uh, what they really may want is for you to be a teacher, a coach, you know, someone who talks about the Bible and archaeology and, you know, good things from history, but please don't disturb the peace. So uh, to be an agent of transformation prophetically is one where you may, again, professionally put yourself at risk. So what, what, what my bid to pastors is, sometimes we need to put on the, uh, some, there's a time in the history of God's people where God is raising up a priesthood when God's people are all disorganized and they reorganize reality. And then there are times when reality is organized and people get too fixed and riveted to this is the way things have to be, that God raises up a prophet. And what do prophets do? They throw a bowling ball into that and say uh, that, you know, we got to dismantle reality and rethink the way in which we've done this. Isaiah 1, uh, God says, I'm tired of all your extra services and your Sabbaths and your special worship services and, and enough of all of that. Well, the priests have called us to do that. Well, yeah, but what I'm calling you to is, is put the widow, the orphan, the stranger, the sojourner first. So don't try and worship me with all this junk while you're still doing all this other stuff. And, and a prophet is raised to challenge that reality. Now, I think the call is to be like Jeremiah, that when we challenge reality, we also are the ones who stick around long enough to priestly reorganize reality. So I've been in this congregation 15 years, and some of the stuff that I've spent five years establishing to getting into place to organizing reality, guess what? Five years later, I'm the guy who's saying, we got we to gotta dismantle that. Yeah, but Mark, you built that. You, you blood, sweat, and teeth. Yeah, but the way we're working that now, we're... we're We've got imagination gridlock around that, and and we gotta we gotta bust out of that. We we've got to stop holding ourselves hostage to that way of doing it. And the the benefit and the burden of a longer term pastorate is that we find ourselves dismantling some of the very reality that we spent a long time constructing. And I think that's the one of the challenges. When is when is the spirit calling me to be a prophet? And when is the spirit calling me to be a priest? But I want to say to you, if, if, I, if I dare, if I could pastor you in a moment to say, don't be a prophet that just destroys reality and then leaves. Uh, you challenge the process, you challenge reality, and then you, in a priestly way, you rebuild a new one with them. That's transformational leadership. Time for questions, comments, and as always, rebuttals. Dang. Um, so I will say, just so we get this right, the, the, the term that would, that would match yours in the Lutheran world is, is conference. The synod is a bigger geographical swath. I just wanted, okay. you know, thank you. Conference. But there are some really great um, questions in the chat. Um, and I will, unless someone wants to speak their question, I'm gonna just wait a minute. I can 
share. Um, I'm in campus ministry, and as you were talking about uh, congregations wa not wanting to rock the boat, but I'm, I'm paraphrasing greatly, but I was thinking that's exactly what my students want. Mm -hmm. And so I wondered what, how this looks different in campus ministry versus congregational ministry, um, like leadership and and how then that impacts the aging of our churches and how churches keep saying, where are all the young people? And the young people that I work with are hungering for the church to speak up and show up in environmental justice and social justice, racial justice, LGBTQ justice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I feel like there's this great disconnect and it, for a long time, we've said campus ministry is at the forefront of the church ship, if we think of ourselves as a ship, kind of because campuses and universities are at the forefront of society and changes. And so it's like we're, we're trying to alert the rest of the ship, like this is what's coming down the line. Here's what we see. And I feel like so often the, the ship is like, well, that's not what we want. So good luck with that up there. And then there's this great disconnect. Uh, um, so let's take the next five to six hours to respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> that is, Corrine, that is so good. Um, my quick response to that would be to say, uh, I would say the stock value of your ministry and your position to be able to voice that awareness uh, to and with the administration is really important uh, because right now, I think in the church and in uh, university colleges, uh, educational settings, especially higher learning ones, the anxiety around survival is amazingly high. And the challenge is that the people who are paying the bills for that are working out largely working out of uh, an older church and an older university educational setting imagination. And uh, uh, so I have the very same thing in my church setting where uh, it's the very old people and it's the very young people who are the, the progressives. And it's the people who are in between who are not at all. And uh, somehow the baton and the ministry needs to be shared and passed in some ways to a, a new generation that is hungry to be engaged with things that, that um, matter. I, I, I was tempted to say really matter, but uh, forgive me for that, but, but matter, um, uh, especially around uh, loving neighbors, loving enemies, and uh, doing good kingdom work together. And, and uh, the church and the universities are not necessarily built for that right now. So they're, they're trying to serve and keep that, that uh, generation in whatever ways they can. And there have to be bridges for uh, of awareness and dialogue for those two worlds to be talking to one another in the church and in the academy. And that puts work in the church on, on pastors and faith formation people. And in the academy, I think it puts it on people like you, chaplains and deans of the chapel to say, look, um, if there is going to be a future, a future of this organization, uh, we need to find better ways of, of engaging and involving in leadership direction uh, 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 with, with the juice that's uh, alive in, in, in these younger people. Because quite frankly, they don't care about organizations. They care about um, doing the work of making the difference. And they're to be commended for that. Uh, for those of us who are still working in these organizations, it's a balancing act because as soon as you talk about um, uh, ministry to migrants, uh, to foreigners, 
uh, to uh, sexual minorities, to uh, you know, people who aren't like us, whoever the us is, uh, donors get real nervous. And, and, and these are the realities that, that uh, college and university presidents uh, develop a lot of heartburn over. You want to push back on that, Kareem? Sure, just a second, buddy. I have a note. Um, sorry, just a second, buddy, okay? Uh, no, I think what you said makes sense. Um, I wish that there was a way we could, I think we all need each other. So I was thinking like the young adults I work with have such energy and passion for so much. And, um, and I agree, the very old are in that, they, it's like they can talk to each other and get it. And then that middle, just a second, buddy, in that middle um, group, I think we need them too to say, to help sustain it. Indeed. Like the, I, I can see a lot of burnout when things aren't happening. And so to have that, um, to have older generations say, we know things don't happen overnight and how can we help sustain you and support you so you don't burn out? What are you doing? <laughs> okay, you sorry. He wants to play Minecraft with us. <laughs> um, there are some other questions, a uh, couple of comments in the in the chat about. One of the things that that we do as Lutherans is we, we have boundary workshops that we go to. Um, I think they're required every three years, something like that. And uh, one of our people here just mentioned how she really recalls uh, the message uh, being driven home about um, you know having good boundaries um, and not becoming friends with your congregations, but build build relationships so you can get stuff done. Um, and how uh, there's such a dissonance there, and and just how does this how does this play into um, our patterns uh, as clergy? Yeah, I, that that's so good, um, and it's so confusing as pastors. When I uh, when I've done teaching work at our seminary, I I hear from this new. Uh, this newer generation that there's a, a strong desire not to be looked up to as as a um, in a pastoral role, but to be friends within the congregation. And I, and I I push against that, and I say, no, uh, you are like a cop. You are like a doc. Uh, they need to be able to idealize you. And that's an important part of the, the leader follower relationship. That doesn't mean that you can't be friend like, uh, but at the end of the day, you are always their, their pastor. And so uh, what you have to be clear on is what you are able to do always wearing the pastoral role. And, and my perspective is that um, in that sense, your church is never your church. Uh, it's and on one level, it's Christ's church. On a second level, um, it, it's, it can't be the community that feeds you. It can't be the community that takes care of you. That, I mean, they'll, they'll take care of your housing and your continued education and your salary, but uh, your emotional needs need to be met somewhere else. And uh, there, there are uh, crowds of listeners who either say "Amen" or say "No," <laughs> and and I and and your your um, commenter is, is spot on that this boundary work is important. So I liken it to when you're driving down the road, there are places where there's a double line and neither cross over. There are places that um, a pastor has a dotted line on her side and can move over um, at select times and it's vice versa. But in the, in the pastoral relationship, there's double lines, there's dotted lines, there's a solid and a double uh, on, on each side. And that's confusing, but pastors need to know 
what part of the road are you on? Uh, and you need to maintain those even if the parishioners don't want to. Is that a keep moving, Laura? Yeah, I'm not seeing, I'm not hearing or seeing anyone move. So yeah, do we want to, do we want to take a breather? People want to take a five minute break? Or we keep moving? Anyone uh, you want to do a show of hands if you, if you need a break, just five minutes? You know what? Let's just keep moving and, and um, yep. if you take a break. Take a yep. break. And come on back. We'll still be here. That's right. And and you'll get the uh, you'll have the video. You'll have the the PowerPoint slides on the other side of this. Good. So um, since everything in the world happens twice, uh, once in the imagination and then when we actual actualize it, I think we we as pastors should be talking or at least thinking about or using groups like this to reflect on. So what's going on in my imagination? Uh, so when I uh, was doing my research study, I said to a group of, uh, there were retirees, about 20, 25 of them. And at the front end of a class I was teaching with them, I just said to them, you know, let's just, let's just uh, play with this a minute. And I pulled out the whiteboard and I said, tell me, uh, what's a pastor? Well, what do you mean? A, what's a pastor? You're a pastor. No, but I mean, what's, what's a pastor? And, and I'll just start making a list. Well, we filled this uh, four foot by six foot whiteboard in 15 minutes time with all kinds of words. And I said to them, and I mean, there were, there were more than 30 for sure. I said, so which is it? And they said, well, it's all of them. And I said, yeah, but how do you, uh, you know, what are the main ones that, well, we've never thought about this, uh, you know, and I, and I said, you know, how we imagine a, a pastor is, uh, is, an, is an important thing to, to think about and talk about. And when you are engaging your leaders, hopefully in an annual review process, uh, it's, it would be an important opportunity, an important time to be saying, okay, how are you imagining this and how am I imagining it? And talk about that. Uh, so Brene Brown has this uh, wonderful story that she tells in, in Rising Strong about how she and her husband are in conflict and they're swimming and they get back to the dock and, and uh, she is gotten to the point of saying, okay, here's why I'm all hacked off at you right now. And, and she says, the story that's going on in my head is this. And then she gives voice to it. And her husband is able to say, well, okay, uh, the story that I'm telling myself, uh, you know, here's my experience of it is this. And she acknowledges that, oh, she had all of this stuff that she was pairing up in her head and this meant this, and this is connected to that. And this is why she's so pissed in this moment uh, because he's all of these things. Uh, but, you know, given him some space to, uh, to share where he's coming from, he's, he's working out of a different narrative. And this kind of dynamic is going on in every relationship. And it is certainly going on in the clergy congregational one. And this is why I, I, I'm firm with the pastors in my care. You have got to insist on at least annual conversations because uh, we've got multiple stories going on and multiple models for ministry, uh, things that we have a passion for, that we want to do, that we feel called to do, that we think the church needs that the church does not see, that the church does not think it needs. And the church comes with its own set that we may or may not know about. So uh, my bid for us is to, to find ways of having those Brene Brown kind of dialogues with her intimate uh, around, oh, so this is how you're thinking about it. This is how you're imagining it. Because how we imagine it 
is going to show up in what we what we do and, and what we say. So both pastors and congregations have uh, models about how we think it's supposed to be. Um, uh, you know, in my shop, uh, the, their, their, one of their previous pastors uh, devoted his life to calling on widows and widowers. Well, it took me five years to, to break that imagination to say, in a congregation of 800 people, I'm not doing that. I, 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 no, I can't do, say that you know, and, and expect that overnight. That took a, a number of years to work toward that to say, how can I empower you to do the maintenance stuff so that I can be spending my, my energy on the crisis and on leadership and on, on the kinds of, and, and that, that took years to untangle that. Uh, but uh, that happens in a process of working with the working models that a pastor has and that a church has. And, they, and it's, it's a process of negotiation there. It, it can't be, uh, well, I'm not doing that. That, that doesn't work. Um, and, and oftentimes what happens is we don't have these conversations until we are, are at, a, at an impasse or, or uh, where we can't. Uh, where, where, where the, the conversation becomes almost adversarial. So this is why I, I, I encourage leaders to create a container for, for, for conversation so that uh, there's some pairing in the, the congregation and, or in the pastor and in the congregation's lay leadership uh, around what are we each being called to do? And in this, uh, in this marriage, if you will, between pastor and congregation, how, how can both sets of needs be met? Uh, so change, I, I highlight at the bottom in systems theory, change happens when we change the way we relate to each other, we relate to loss. Um, so the, the way to change the system, I, I wanna assert is, is through the relational process. So I've got a faith formation guy who's regularly dealing with some challenges and, and he's tempted to change that through policy. And I'll say, no, what you need to do is change that through practices. People change their, their minds. They're reluctant to change their minds, but you can have them change their practices and suddenly, oh, my mind has changed about, about this. And, and that then brings about the kind of change that we, that we wanna have in our congregations. I wanna see if I can successfully play this. Um, if you're familiar with the, the, the uh, TV show New Amsterdam, this was, this was a lead-in. And uh, to me, the first time I saw this, I, I thought I have to find a way to steal that, to capture that, uh, because this is all about uh, what I think pastoral ministry is, is about. Let's see if I can do this. Everyone in the cardiac surgical department, please raise your hands. You're all fired. Any department who places billing above care will be terminated. We all feel like the system is too big to change. But guess what? We are the system, and we need to change. So, how can I help? I'm not going to let you just help people. So let's help as many as we can before they figure us out. Everyone in the Oops. cardiac... Um, so... Uh, that, that is a really good image to me of pastoral leadership. Uh, we have been invited now, called into this dynamic of being the community and, and a leader within it. And there's a big part of pastoral leadership that is subversive. And so that if you are uh, if you really know what you're up to or up against, um, you are you're going to be flying under the radar a little bit. Not everyone can know uh, what you're up to, and and uh, pastoral because if they did, they would say no. We're 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 not ready for that. So um, uh, it's time for a story. Uh, I'm showing you a map of my neighborhood. My neighborhood has 98 houses in it. It's an association, and um, uh, 
Uh, we've got 15 acres of green space and there's a soccer field, there's a pool, there's a basketball court and uh, there's, a, there's a playground. And I never learned so much about the church until I became president of our neighborhood association, something I will never do again, by the way. Uh, but I did it for seven years. I love my neighborhood. Don't get the wrong idea about that. But uh, our association dues were, uh, our costs were rising and our association dues were going to go up $50 a year. Our association dues were like, I don't know, $500 a year uh, to maintain a pool basketball court. That's cheap living. Um, uh, but you would have thought that this neighborhood uh, was going to lose its mind over a $50 increase. Now, my neighbors go out to eat twice a week. Yeah, I don't, but they do. And it's like, what is the big deal? You know, most of you make two or three times what I do, and you're losing your mind over a $50 increase. And, and the anxiety was all over the system and, and distrust for the board. And I'm just, I'm exhausted by this. And I'm, I'm sitting down at my computer ready to write a, you know, a pastoral memo to my community to try and calm the waters. And, and there's a knock at my garage door and I open it up and here's this little seven, eight year old girl. And she's, she's holding a coffee can and she's got five or six kids in tow. And, and she says, uh, here, Mr. Nellison, this is for you. And I said, well, what is this? And I, I, I took it from her and it, you know, it, it took my hand away. It was so heavy. And she said, well, uh, we heard the neighborhood was in trouble and we, we sponsored a couple of lemonade stands and, and we raised $47 and 77 cents for the neighborhood. Uh, and then she skipped off with, with her whole entourage. Okay. I shut the door. I lost it. I mean, I even talking about it now I get choked up and, and, you know, I changed the memo that I'm writing to the neighborhood and I told that story. And I said, uh, I wonder, I wonder what these kids picked up on. I mean, here I thought it was just me in my leadership role that was, uh, that was anxious about everybody getting stressed out and angry about, uh, about this. And, and now what these kids did, they didn't send an angry email or a happy one. Uh, as Corrine said, they, they work, and now these kids are Corrine's uh, kids age, uh, college kids age, um, they work together. They turn toward one another. They used imagination to address a problem that they didn't understand. And I got to tell you that when I told that story, I said, you know what, I'm going to match that 4777 and throw that into the till in addition to my dues increase. And I'm sure it was, it was almost half the neighborhood heard that story and they threw in another 4777 in addition to the dues increase. And then I'm getting emails and Mark, you, you know, you need, we need new soccer nets and we, we need a new basketball pole because the old one is bent. And now all these people are ready to spend money because they've been inspired by the story of these kids. And, and sometimes it takes just a little imagination and togetherness to change the narrative. And, but, but what it takes is, is being, in, in, you know, none of that would have happened with me in this role, uh, without me in this role, holding the anxiety, theirs and mine, and trying to navigate it. And, you know, what do these kids know? I don't know, but I am the one who sort of curates reality a little bit. And what I lift up before the community now has the potential to, to reshape us. So if I'm responding to these emails with, you're a jerk, get on board, you know, which I want to do, but I'm not going to. Uh, but uh, now lifting up that kind of story changed the narrative. And, and so, and that, that was several years ago. And now, uh, it's amazing how the community can continue to live out of that narrative when the threat of a $25 increase is coming down the pipeline. So you may know uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so as long as you are uh, focused or worried about the, uh, the 
uh, the lower needs on the the uh, on the pyramid uh, that can interfere and interrupt with uh, self actualization, self fulfillment. And so Maslow will talk about you know you need food, water, warmth, rest, elimination. It, you you got to have this, and, and and as long as your survival needs. Uh, that's another attachment thing. As long as your survival needs are focused on, uh, 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 or, or your needs are being focused, or your energies are focused on survival needs, you're not going to have time for relationships. You're not going to have time for uh, a, a capacity for others or an imaginative capacity uh, to to think and dream. I've got uh, two, now they're post-college students, they're 22 22-year-old twins, but I watched this in my son uh, last year who uh, lived in an off-campus house, and uh, he had he had to focus on rent, and uh, I mean, he's donating plasma to, uh, to be able to eat and to, to buy groceries, to pay gas, to, to pay utilities, and the kid was stressed out. Well, why? Because he was dealing with the first two uh, two categories on the bottom and and then second or the next term he came to live at home and yeah he doesn't pay the light bill so it's always on and uh, he's eating me out of house and home but the stress level has dropped immensely and he's able to look beyond college and he's able to think about career again when he's not focused on uh, you know am I going to have a place to lay my head tonight now, take the story of Levi, my, my son, uh, and impose that on the church. As long as the church is uh, scared to death about membership loss and scared to death around the, uh, are the bills going to be paying, they're going to be like my neighborhood association, and, and they're going to be gripped by, and, by, by things that are going to hold them hostage. So, you know, don't come with a master plan. Don't come with, you know, here's our, here's our 10-year or our five-year goals. Pastor, are you crazy? We don't know if we're going to be alive five months from now. What you want to do to move them to that next level is find, be inspired by these kids in my neighborhood. What can we do together? It's time for a potluck or a social or a, a, a driveway thing, or I, I mean, a church parking lot event or, you know, something's what can tie us together that can bring us into the next stages so that, uh, so that we have some of those security needs met? You, as a pastor, you know that um, when a woman loses her husband, uh, one of the hardest things for her to do that next week is come back to church. I'm talking about pre-COVID world, of course. Um, and it's just sometimes... The first two weeks, she's sitting out in the parking lot, or she's having a hard time getting out of bed. Well, um, you know, you know that person is moving and evolving uh, and processing their loss when they get to a point of coming back to church. And now, maybe I can, uh, you know, maybe I can do something social, but that's going to be some work. Well, sometimes a year later, well, now I'm. Now, for the first time, I'm ready to take a trip, or I'm ready to write a poem, uh, or I'm, I'm ready to do something creative. Well, there's no way she can do that in, in the first week or the first month, because why? She's in survival mode. So our churches tend to operate out of a survival mode, and the way in and through that is not reaching for the top of the pyramid. It's about addressing some of those basic needs. So as long as you're in survival mode, you're not going to thrive. I wonder if that's a good, yeah, I think that's a good place to pause uh, because that once again is a lot. Are there comments or questions? So what I'm hearing is <laughs> there are very few places and very con few congregations right now after a year of COVID that are probably in a place that are ready to hear about any big master plans my my response to that would be absolutely so okay. I, i'm just I'll, I'll give an illustration 
uh, I'll be as practical as I can out of my own leadership in this church. When we went into quarantine on March 13 of, of last year, whatever that year was, <laughs> hindsight is 2020. Um, uh, um, when we went into quarantine, I said to our staff, we have got to find ways of ensuring that people feel connected. So we, we, we changed from a ministry delivery system, uh, sometimes a bit of a cruise ship, it feels like, uh, to saying, no, we got to sort of be a, a broadcasting entity. And so uh, Monday is for missions. We're going to send out a, an email that says, here's what we're doing far away. Here's what we're doing near. Uh, we're going to call this near and far. So Monday missions near and far, they're going to get an email and we're going to, we're going to send, tell them something every week on Wednesday, we're going to make a three or five minute video about here's some news items and we're going to send, put it on YouTube and we're going to uh, click on a link and you can see your pastor saying, Hey, uh, church, there's uh, three things we want you to know. Um, and then on Thursday, I send out a, a, a prayer guide and, and uh, if there's surgery and chemo and whatever, here's a, here's a blurb. Uh, and then that person's picture is on it. And then here's some things that are going to happen on Sunday's uh, broadcast. And then my worship director on Friday or Saturday will send out a, a YouTube link. So they, we went from doing none of that to saying, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, uh, there's going to be a prompting to Sunday. And those practices have uh, uh, kept connections alive um, and, and ensured that, that they're there when, when people can't have that. Now, is that a lot of work? Yes. Um, is it exhausting? Is it wearing? Oh, yeah but we've had to adapt to make that happen. Now, don't over idealize that and say, I stink as a pastor because I'm not doing all of that. Because I know uh, I, I'm, one of, I'm one of you, I get it, that we, we tend to do that. But just remember, I've got, I've got a staff of about 10 here and I got IT people who can do what I can't do. But you, you need to say in your own shop, how do we address those psychological and safety and belonging needs and make them happen in this this time of crisis so then then if i call if i call uh parishioners i'll say how you doing what oh thank you pastor we, we still feel connected to the church even though we haven't been there in, in a year and you know what every sunday we get up and at nine o'clock we get dressed up we're in our church clothes we turn on the computer and, and we're ready to go. Well, I hear that. And now on Sunday morning, I will say, and I'll say it into the camera. Um, and, you know, just know that the majority of you are not in the pews. We know you're out there. Uh, we we want to encourage you during the passing of the peace, the touchless passing of the peace, send a text. Think about someone you want to, uh, in church life, that you want to pray for or write to. Uh, and, and you know what, thank you for being a part of us to such a degree that you've gotten dressed up uh, to go to your kitchen church this morning uh, to be a part of our body life. <coughs> and then some of my people who are here uh, who aren't wearing masks and, you know, think everybody who's not here is a scaredy cat are saying, oh, wow, there's people really getting dressed up. Oh, yeah, yeah. So now they're imagining people that they're not seeing. And, and so pastors have to work with people's imagination and you have to be aware of your own. <coughs> Others, keep going. I'll, I'll just jump in here. When you were talking about mapping the anxiety of the community and, you know, subverting the conversation in a more positive direction. Um, my husband, Ronald's also a pastor and he's taught me the art of the dumb and happy response when the criticism comes. And I don't know where, he, I think he picked it up on a podcast, but the example is 
somebody grousing about the damage on the wall from the preschool. And they were trying to hook the pastor into a about that. And instead saying, gosh, you know, I know, but isn't it great that we're using this building for this ministry? And this is just a consequence of having kids in the building, you know, trying to <laughs> acknowledge it, but then flip it into the positive. Yeah, very good. And, and it's a, like a skill that I want to perfect because it totally like, when they're trying to hook you as your leader, you know, they're trying to hook your anxiety into the survival mode stuff. It's like, no, 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 we can flip out of that. So I just shared that gift because it's been awesome to learn. What was the phrase again? Dumb and, Dumb and happy. happy. Yeah. Basically the art of not acknowledging all of some, you know, being selective about what you acknowledge about the big problem, but to just be happy, to just uh -huh. say, this is a good thing that's happening. That's good. That's really good. That that's something that Andrea, you and your mate could, uh, you know, that would be an amazing leadership article that you could write for your church, mm. <laughs> your denominational newsletter or something like. I mean, to share that with with others with a couple of stories. That's good. We too have a daycare here, and. Um, you know, one of the blessings of that is it's a community connection. Uh, one of the curses of it is that, um, you know, from your own experience that when you have kids, you and your partner say, yeah, let's just hold off on buying a new couch until they're out of the house or that scratch on the, on the floor. We'd love new flooring, but forget it. It's not worth it uh, to replace it until they go off to college. And the problem with churches with that is that uh, church like this has had a daycare for 25 years. So your house is always in this state of scratched and ripped and markers on the walls. Keep going. Laura says, yeah. Uh, 15 minutes. Is that about right? <clears throat> okay. I want to say uh, with David Odom that the leader's task it's about growing security and trust in relationships. Now, depending on what leadership book you would read, some say, well, leadership is just getting something done. Well, you can get uh, amazing things done at enormous cost. So um, I'm going to quote my uh, son's favorite comedian, who's anything but clean, uh, who says, oh, yeah, uh, you know, maybe there was some benefits for slavery. You got a transcontinental railroad built and you got uh, pyramids constructed at enormous human cost of, you know, of millions of lives. Well, that was worth it. Um, so, yeah, you could get great things done in the church, but at what cost and at what sacrifice of values? Uh, oh, we don't want to do that. Uh, so the, the leadership that we want to uh, that I want to advocate for is to say, I think leaders do their best work when we put, invest ourselves in uh, relationship building and security building in, in the life of our congregation. So when you meet their attachment needs uh, of pro being responsive, of, of being affirming, of being encouraging, of being empowering, of trusting them, they will begin to trust you more. And of course, that takes time. Um, and, and yet, uh, because the, the best stuff in leadership acknowledges, goes back to the childhood dynamic that, that uh, a leader is a type of parent, um, when you are in a parenting of sorts role uh, with your congregation, that is, you're the go-to, you're the one that's responsive, you're the one who listens, you're the one who can be trusted, that trust is your greatest stock value in your congregation. So how do you get there? Well, you listen, and, and you listen for the things that they're not saying. Uh, you trust people and, and you give them a, a task and you say, I, I see that you have gifts in this area and the church has a real need right now. Um, and, and then 
If you're a little OCD like me and you have your preferred way of how they should do it and they don't do it that way, you accept the way they've done it. Just like you may do with your kids or your teenagers. Oh yeah, they, they bring a way different way and a different pace of doing it. But the fact that, they, that you trusted them to do it, uh, it get over your hangups uh, because uh, you've, you've communicated that, that you trust them. And, and sometimes I will say to the congregation, I'd say once a year here, uh, you know, isn't it a, a remarkable thing that God trusts you to do this ministry? Wait a minute, God trusts me? Well, maybe I better maybe I better show up for the meeting, or maybe I better take this a little more a, a little more seriously. Yeah, God, God trusts you to uh, uh, to do this. Well, that there's empower empowerment in that. I think it's important to name our mistakes. Uh, in in my tradition, you know, whatever the pastor says is right and perfect until uh, she messes up or she's wrong or whatever, and. And then there's all sorts of shame and blame around that. Well, you know, wear it. Uh, maybe sometimes even wear it when it doesn't completely uh, belong to you because you say, you know what? Uh, we're finding our way and we're going to learn along the way. And, and nobody, nobody does it right or perfect the, the first time. What we want to do is make sure nobody gets hurt. We want to uh, make sure that this is uh, meaningful in the life of our community. And, and we're going to discover that together. And, and I, <clears throat> I come from a spot of, uh, as, a, as an educator, there's um, what's known as heuristic learning, H-E-U-R. Uh, uh, it comes from the Greek word heureka. Um, uh, heuristic learning is about uh, discovering for yourself. So uh, I'm utterly convinced that in the Gospels, when Jesus says, uh, now don't tell anybody who I am. Uh, I think he's doing that in part because he's advocating for heuristic learning. He's, he wants people to discover for themselves on their terms uh, what it means to follow him. And yeah, it'd be a whole lot easier if you just had to learn these five things or believe these things. But no, J Jesus wants you to get to know him in your skin, in your narrative, in your experience, because when you do, um, you're going to be all the more invested. As a leader, um, I, I say to my folks here, uh, under promise and over deliver. So I, I'll always say to my teams that I'm reporting to, um, you know, I, I, will, I should have a response for you by Friday, which says to me, Mark, uh, by Wednesday noon, you're communicating to them. Now, they're not saying that, but the more you uh, give more than you've promised, and the more that you give more than than is expected, uh, the more wow that that that's a practice that grows trust. So if you say something, follow through and follow through early, and that grows security and trust. And as one of you said, maybe some of this stuff is a no brainer, but you know some of us our brains go on cruise control and. We just need to hear what we already know. So I trust that you probably already know this stuff, but it's a good reminder to all of us. And at the very least, it's a good reminder to me. Here's some select best care practices for leaders. Um, realize that you are in a relationship rather than in a role. Roles tend to be about doing. Uh, relationships tend to be about being. And so uh, it's very, it's easier to be a, a human doing than a human being. And uh, the ability to be accessible and relatable is, is key in your leadership uh, practices. Recognize your own anxiety and try and calm yourself in it. So when I'm in my neighborhood thing and people are all scrambling about money, uh, you know, I, I got to own all of this that's mine. And I got, I got to find a way to process this without transmitting it. And it, it's that way for me as a, a pastor, for sure. <coughs> Be accessible and uh, signal accessibility. And uh, so one of my practices uh, from the beginning of my ministry is that a half hour before a worship service starts, I'm out in the parking lot 
and I greet people before they come in the door. And I got elders and other leaders who always want to tell me stuff or they want to pray for me or over me or with me. And I'll say, pray for me on your own. This is more, this is my prayer. My prayer is to be available and accessible to the congregation. And I need to tell you that as a, as a congregational life pastor in this church, I do more pastoral care in that half hour before worship because pastor, I meant to email you, I meant to call you and, and well, okay. Um, uh, let's, you know, let's connect sometime this week over, over coffee and people will tell you things on the fly as they're walking past you that they will never tell you on the phone. Uh, and I'm probably not telling you anything, you know, but my congregation never had a pastor do that. The pastor always greets after the service and tries to get rid of people as fast as they can and on to lunch. Well, the fact that, that, you know, I, my church knows when I'm at church and when I'm not, and uh, there's some patterns to that, that, that grows trust. Even the people who don't like me, they trust me, which is fine. That's, uh, I'd rather have your respect than, than your affirmation any day. Uh, accept others, especially the reluctant, especially those who see things differently. See the potential. Um, if you have children, uh, it's always wise when they're younger to say, you know what, I see this in you. Uh, I can't believe the number of colleagues I have, especially uh, female pastors who heard as a seventh grader, their pastors say to them, you know, I could imagine you being a pastor someday. Well, is that allowed? Could, could I do that? Well, that planted a seed in a number of these women who are phenomenal pastors. And I, I commend their pastors, not only for uh, seeing it, but having the courage to say, say it. And they've blessed the church because they've, they've acknowledged some things. And so uh, people are, you know, just like with your, your partner, your spouse, your kid, you can never hear I love you enough if, if the pastor is the one who is, is uh, affirming and acknowledging and, and seeing the potential, uh, that, that can go a long way. One of my colleagues uh, shared with me a couple of years ago that his, his father passed away. And in my, uh, in my denomination, his, his father was a highly, highly respected preacher. And, and at the uh, funeral visitation, the, uh, the pastor was, was uh, greeting, uh, being greeted by people who was, were expressing their condolences. And, and uh, one of the people who came through the line said, you know, I sat down under your, your, pa your dad's preaching for 15 years. And he said, I got to tell you, I don't remember a thing that, that he preached on. I, I ate all those meals, but I don't remember what I ate. And then he said, but I will never, ever forget uh, the day that I got a phone call from your dad and he just called me and he knew it was my birthday and he wished me a happy birthday. I'll never forget that my pastor did that. And so that tells you something about uh, the need or the yearning or the wanting of connection that, that people have with their pastors. And I would say, that was probably some of the most important leadership that he ever offered. My seminary will teach you wonderful Greek, but they won't teach you that. And, and somehow we've got we've to gotta be doing that. Use listening and inquiry. Um, use curiosity, not certainty. So I hear that in the dumb and happy suggestion of, oh, you know, uh, you make a good observation or, oh, have, have you thought about it this way? There's power in reframing ourselves and, and others. Uh, seven, I sort of covered. You orchestrate attention on the good. So in the story of my subdivision, uh, I chose to lift up the story of these kids, not their money, uh, their heavy coffee can, their initiative, their imagination, their friendship. What did they pick up on? They picked up on something that was going on in their household. Well, Pastors name reality. We know we all know this elephant is out there. Take risks and be okay with failure, and uh, and motivate by your motivation and, and energy. Uh, for for about ten years, I was a little league baseball coach, 
And I knew that if you get one or two of these fourth, fifth or sixth graders get a hit, uh, hitting is contagious. Well, criticism is contagious. Uh, orneriness and depression and COVID crankiness is contagious. So uh, what else can we do that, that can be contagious? In my shop, we spent a month highlighting, we sent a care package to all of the teachers. Thank you for, you know, it's been hard on teachers this year. Uh, we sent them a little lunch box with a gift card to Jimmy John's and a granola bar and, and uh, a note that said, we appreciate you and delivered these to 85 teachers. And we did the same thing with, uh, with our medical people. And, and we're off to, you know, uh, we just need to, you know, sprinkle a little pixie dust on these people's lives because everybody's freaking cranky these days. And that, that just changed the, change the direction. Some of them are still cranky at their church, but they got this, you know, grace in a box and it, it, it changed the direction of things a little bit. I think I need to either pause or quit here because I, I want to leave room for whatever may be next. And I don't know how many slides I've got left, but you'll get them in the mail sometime today. Laura, all, all you at this point. We'll put the slides, uh, I'll link them on our website. That's where they'll live, along with the recording of uh, this as well. So are there any final questions or comments you want to be sure get raised? In the absence of that, what I would like to do um, as we think about our next time is, Laura, I, I want to send you... Um, uh, a piece that I wrote uh, years ago for Journal for Preachers. It's called uh, Beyond Survival, when the church is in survival mode. And it's got some reflections on some of this, but I'd love to encourage our participants to think about reading that. And what I want to do is, um, uh, as we think about our next time, uh, to give you a text. And uh, the, the text and the context is Acts 1. And you rem know that uh, Luke and Acts are, you know, that Luke is the, the prequel and Acts is the sequel. And both of those books begin at a dead end. In Luke 1, it's barren women. Uh, it's the spirit moving over the emptiness and, and doing a new thing in, in an Abraham and Sarah-like moment in these these young women who have impossible pregnancies. Well, uh, where there's a dead end, the spirit begins to do some work. In the emptiness, the spirit does some work. In Acts 1, it's the same thing where, um, you know, Jesus, are you going to fix Jerusalem now? And the hardest part about being a disciple is we're expecting you to take over Rome. We're expecting you to reclaim Jerusalem. And Jesus didn't do that. He messed up that model. And then he didn't come in in a Hummer or in a SUV. He comes in humility. So he broke that model. And then he, he was crucified. And well, that and put to public shame. That's not what happens to a king. And then he even messed up our model on death by resurrecting. And then just then when we thought no, normalcy was going to return, and now the kingdom is going to come, he disappears. He leaves us. And now what? And Acts 1 begins the same way Luke does with emptiness and the spirit doing something uh, around uh, empowerment. And so uh, in this article, I have a, a, a mini lectionary, if you will, on uh, in the season of, of Easter, what is the church to do when uh, on the way to Pentecost, when we feel alone, abandoned, and all of our models for the world that we knew have been taken away. Um, here's some resourcing for you to think about and to think about for next time around how do we, how do we move our congregations, our communities, and ourselves through this time of luck, not past, but through. Uh, so I'll send you that too. Great, great. All right, and I'll make that available to everybody as well for to 
prepare for next time. So, okay, that was a fire hose. Wow, thank Sorry. you. No, no, it's good. It's good. It's all good stuff. It's um um. So thanks for being here, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Peace. Yeah, peace to everybody. <laughs>